My name is Bill Smith. I'm president of the Seedman Alumni Association. I'm longtime Seedman adjunct faculty, and I own a company called CompuCraft Technology Services. Of all the things, one of the things I love most are these breakfasts. Um, thank you, Peter and Joan, for supporting this for so many years. I know Peter has a deep love for students and getting them exposed to this kind of thing, uh, these kind of discussions, and we have a lot of students here today. Um, all of these students over here, wave your hand. Uh, I have to remind us older folks that uh, students sometimes don't know that there are two 730s in the day. So a round of applause for our <laughs> students that got up in the morning. Uh, we have some distinguished uh, guests, President Haas, um, our own Dean uh, of Seedman, Diana Lawson, um, Fred Keller's Christina, I'm sorry, I don't know you, Maria. Hi. And <laughs> Provost. So we have a room full of, that's right, that's right, that's right. Well. Peter, I often say that based on what it takes to get into Seedman these days, I never would have gotten in. I, I, I might have had to go to Michigan State. <laughs> oh. 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 Bonnie, this may be my last breakfast. <laughs> so uh, we have Michael DeWild today that will be serving as our monitor. He is going to uh, introduce our distinguished guests. Um, one other side note, I'm particularly excited that Fred Keller is on this panel. Um, Fred's kind of been my life and, uh, and uh, business mentor for many <coughs> years. Uh, got started in the uh, early, early days. But when we were talking about this, Fred, one of the things that I remembered is way back when it wasn't cool, we got on the cover of Robotics Today for automation that was going on in the uh, plants. Yeah. There you go. It was pretty incredible. So, yeah. so uh, Michael, I'm going to turn this over to you, and uh, we look forward to you making this a very interesting morning. Great. I will do what I can. Uh, I think I'm Mike, so everybody can hear me. I'll get started. Uh, thank you, Bill, and good morning to all of you, Mr. Misasekia, President Haas, Provost Chimatilli. Dean Lawson, and even faculty who are here. Um, welcome to this March Secchi Breakfast. On the theme of conver the convergence of technology and work, it's my privilege to share the stage this morning with three business leaders who will offer their thoughts and observations with us on emerging technologies <coughs> and their impact on work and on workers. First, from the perspective of their own businesses, then from uh, the industry that they're in, and then if we have time, the larger societal perspective as well. By technologies this morning, we mean especially automation, artificial intelligence, and robotics. As you're all aware, this particular generation of emergent technologies uh, has prompted a great deal of prognostication. Uh, the late, great Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk, for example, uh, have a great deal of concern about what AI in particular might portend for us. Others, champions of it, who suggest that we're on the verge of a period in human history where productivity, wealth, and leisure will be unprecedented. Um, so everything in between is, is on the table. Whatever the future holds, it's likely to require a fair bit of adaptation and adjustment on the part of all of us. And so we'll ask our three speakers to speak to that, both through the lens of their own business and uh, how they think about it in, in larger terms as well. We're going to ask each one of them to speak for two minutes at a time. That's the format. to a piece of this puzzle, and around 8.45, we'll open it up to questions from all of you. Uh, Mr. John Kennedy, to my immediate right here, is the president and CEO of AutoCam Medical. Mr. Spencer Stiles, next to him, the president of Stryker Global Instruments, and Mr. Fred Keller, the founder and chairman of Cascade Engineering. There's much more to say about each of the three of them, <coughs> uh, but in the interest of time, uh, you can read their bios easily enough. On, online. They're all involved in the community deeply as well. Um, 
Mr. Kennedy is going to begin by speaking to automation in business, followed by Mr. Stiles on robotics, especially in the medical field, and then Mr. Keller on talent and workforce development in this particular era of technology. From there, I suspect I will lose control of the dialogue. They will take it where they, <laughs> where they will, um, which probably will be fine, I'm, I'm sure. But with that in mind, uh, Mr. Kennedy, I'll ask you to, to begin. Yeah, and so I'd like to uh, obviously just talk about the whole concept of automation in terms of the way it changes really all of our lives, and it's going to change our lives at an increasingly faster pace. Um, and I'll, I'll give some uh, thoughts on why I think that is. But the, uh, I would consider the technology as it comes into our industries um, and our businesses as disruptive. And how we respond to that disruption, I think, determines whether we're a winner or a loser in this, in this game. And one of the things that I want to put forth is there are things we need to do in Michigan in particular to ready ourselves for some disruption that I think is going to occur relatively dramatically in the automotive industry. But a little bit of context in terms of how we look at automation. Um, you know, we started with automating things in our plants um, with the concept of focusing on cost, obviously uh, pulling labor out of the product. But over time, that was no longer the reason that we did it. It was primarily for quality reasons. So in, in the product that we make, which are uh, precision machine metal uh, components, the primary driver is obviously uh, very high quality, very close tolerances. And so uh, a human hair is 80 microns in diameter. Our typical tolerances are 10% of a human hair. So these, the parts have to be checked under microscope and looked at very carefully. Can you imagine making those parts using human um, intervention? In other words, can you imagine polishing or et cetera to, um, to that kind of a standard? It's, it's literally impossible. The only way we can do it is with mechanization. So automation of really all of the, the work that we do. And so if you look at our business uh, in the precision machining realm, We've gone from uh, about $100,000 of revenue per worker, um, all while dramatically increasing employment, to about $350,000 uh, in revenue per worker. Wow. <clears throat> and we're looking at things that will drive us to $500,000 uh, per worker. And so the primary reason for that is meeting these quality uh, characteristics. But a new problem has emerged we have a very difficult time finding people. And so the unskilled work that we do have in our facility, we have to virtually eliminate because it's, in, it's nearly impossible to bring uh, new people into the organization. And that's one of the pulls and tugs that we're, we're now seeing. Um, but we're also having trouble getting the skilled workers um, that we need. And our, our, um, our average hourly W-2 is, is a little over $60,000. So in that kind of work, I can't find people um, today. And so that's the other thing that's driving us more and more towards automated systems. Thank you. Mr. Stiles. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's just an honor and pleasure to be here, and it's outstanding to see so many students. Uh, any, any chance I have to... Uh, talk with students and really challenge you uh, to think broadly about helping change our world for the better, I will sign up at any, at any moment. Uh, so it's just a pleasure to be here. So a little background on who I represent. I work for a little medical device company down the street in Kalamazoo, so it's good to come to the big city of Grand Rapids. Uh, <laughs> but we, I work for Stryker, and as a reminder, we are a publicly traded uh, multinational medical device company, and I bring up the publicly traded part uh, in case anyone's uh, tracking in here, obviously any statements I make do not reflect any future earnings of the corporation. <laughs> uh, that's my disclaimer early on. But we have about uh, 33,000 plus employees across the world and we specialize in building medical devices in a variety of specialties. This morning though, I'm gonna focus a bit more on surgical interventions, so doing surgery, cutting open the body to solve a problem, um, and doing so, trying to again, as John highlighted, how do you eliminate some of the variability and improve the quality? 
a, a very similar mindset that's taken place in surgery as it has in manufacturing, which by the way, a big medical device company like us uses automation and robotics for manufacturing. But we move that then into a place like orthopedics and said, how do we remove some of the variability from the various cuts, the various angles, and make that more predictable? And that's really spawned an entire new segment with the medical device, which are robotics. Now, I'll give you in a minute or less the brief history of, of surgical interventions over at least the modern history. We'll call it the last 100 years. As you can imagine, uh, you have an issue, uh, some sort of problem. They want to cut you open and take something out or fix something or tie something back. And not much has changed, uh, you know, I would say from the early 1900s to about now. Uh, cleaning and sterilization has gotten better, and that's a big one to prevent infections. Uh, along the way, re, uh, improving things such as batteries that came out of the consumer business, that helps obviously where some of the products are safer and have more mobility. Optics and uh, navigation and computer information was sort of the next revolution that has helped. Uh, and early on in the days, there was some artificial intelligence where we use voice commands inside the operating room to tell products to do certain things, such as turn on the lights, turn on the lock, turn off the lights, a pretty basic command. Well, along from that technology and in the Bay Area, along came a little company um, called Computer Motion, which was really specialized in uh, early artificial intelligence and started to get into robotics, voice command to move an arm, and that uh, built into a company called Intuitive Surgical. And if you track the medical device uh, space, it's a very successful and somewhat famous company as they came out really with the first commercially available robot that's used in operating rooms across the world. And it's uh, appropriately branded and known as Da Vinci. And how fitting uh, if you think about a transformation that's taking place in healthcare. And the neat thing about that particular technology, it was originally designed uh, to hopefully make progress in the cardiac surgery, although the applications, and this is sometimes true with technology, the applications you set out maybe to solve or utilize aren't necessarily the end result. And ultimately what happened, it, it uh, migrated down into the abdomen and they started to do the prostatectomy case. So these are for individuals that have prostate cancer and the robot allowed a, a, uh, the hands of inside the body, this robot, to actually get behind the prostate and resect it and pull it out carefully something that could not be done with traditional manual instruments. So now you have a technology solving a problem for quality and variability uh, that's truly revolutionizing the business. That transformed other companies investing in robotics and ultimately uh, allowed Stryker a chance to develop an internal program uh, and eventually we went out and acquired one as well and we have a robot called Mako. Uh, and the MAKO technology is for putting in knees in particular, that's really where we'll, we will spend most of our effort in a predictable fashion. So uh, do any of you in here have total knees? Show of hands. There's got to be hopefully a customer or two. Thank you. Uh, uh, in the future, uh, there will be a large majority in this room that will raise their hands, and my guess is there will be a, an extreme portion of that that will be done with robotics. Uh, and you know, the, the change in that technology will happen at an unbelievably rapid pace, and we will see more adoption like uh, never before. So I look forward to sharing more this morning. Thank you. Mr. Keller. Wow. <clears throat> I'd like to hear more of that. <clears throat> um, you know, I'd just like to reflect on what we're hearing, and that is that for us, um, for, many, for most people, work defines who we are. It's our identity. And as we have our work changed, as it's disrupted, uh, how do we respond to that? How do we become, how do we adapt to that, that environment? And, and there's really, um, you know, some of that's very minor, some of it's subtle, some of it's more major. Uh, some people are actually having their jobs replaced uh, by robotics. Uh, some people are, are uh, having to learn new skills. Uh, an example within Cascade Engineering, we, we now are having uh, plants that are, don't have uh, supervisors. The team members are making their own decisions. So that's a, that's a minor thing. It, it's uh, actually not necessarily an AI or robotic thing, but I, actually technology assists in that. It makes it more possible. Uh, we have the ability to be able to have people come in as team members and identify what work needs to get done. Uh, they don't need to have someone tell them what to do and when to do and how to do it. Uh, we have um, uh, situations in, in which the, 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 the team members are able to make the decisions that 
uh, as a team much better than they would ha if, if there was a, a supervisor involved. So uh, in some respects, mm -hmm. we don't have, there's a, there's a displacement of supervision. But it's, it's redefining what that means. Uh, the idea that, that we have um, uh, maintenance being added to our, our machine operator positions, uh, as, as a, the, the idea that you would come in and just simply uh, do your task is one thing, but to be responsible for that entire machine and how well it functions is, an, is a new upskill requirement that we have in our organization. So it's, uh, these are some of the minor twists, uh, certainly not the, the level of uh, making uh, uh, medical changes uh, the way that uh, Spencer's talking about. But the idea that we are having changes in the way we work, and to not mention the whole idea of how much, how many more robots we have. I mean, uh, uh, John mentions the, uh, the increase in, in uh, sales per employee. Uh, we are also seeing that. Uh, we see it as a, as a contract manufacturer, we see that more incrementally. Uh, we, we have uh, seen over the years uh, changes uh, on the order of about a percent and a half uh, per year. <clears throat> improvement or increase in our uh, uh, sales per employee, and that's a very difficult one to use because the costs of materials and everything else uh, and the complexity of the parts and so on. But uh, that, that, uh, that is a minimum requirement from a cost standpoint. We need to be able to have that kind of increase because many of our contracts require us to have uh, continuous uh, cost down proposals. So the idea that, that we are, are required from a financial standpoint, from a quality standpoint, uh, from a, just a, a, an adjustment to our workplace standpoint, is it's, a, it's a, 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 a relentless and continuous kind of thing that's happening within our industry at this point in time. Kind of pick up on that, Fred, and go back to something you said, Mr. Kennedy, and that is um, finding both skilled and unskilled workers. I think the popular mythology in the press is if you look at the recent Oxford study or the, the White House Council of Economic Advisors just came out with a graph last year that said, if you make $20 an hour or less, your chances of being replaced by automation of one kind or another are close to 80% in the next 15 to, to 20 years. The Oxford study said up to 50% of the jobs in the US could be replaced with the technology that's currently available or coming online soon. So as you look at the difficulty of finding workers, are, is, is it a tension at all in your mind between, all right, do we just invest more in automation and stop relying on workers, or is there something that we can or should do to, to build up the workers that we'll, we'll need? Well, uh, in, in, in my mind, it's both. Um, you know, we will clearly continue to move. Um, you know, one of the things we have to do for medical products is I have to validate everything. It's very hard to validate handwork, um, nearly impossible. But where I'm doing something with a computer, I can validate the software and validate that that computer is going to do that, generally speaking, the same way every single time. So our movement will continue in the, in the automation uh, vein. But like in West Michigan, um, you know, talk about the training. Um, we, we recognize we have two problems. Number one, we have uh, a, you know, a bimodal, bimodal distribution of our workforce. We have a group of people that are maybe average age of 50, and that's where our skills uh, workers are at. And then we have an extremely young workforce um, in our Kentwood facility, because we've done most of the hiring in the last uh, four or five years. But we have 170 total people, and the average age is, is a little bit less than 30. And so the bimodal distribution is a very strong hump at the young end of the workforce. Generally speaking, people that we have into some kind of training program, or et cetera, 29 of our 170 employees are in some type of uh, apprenticeship, internship, or et cetera, in order to learn the skills that they need for our, for our work. And so, and our view is we have to do that because we obviously, we hope that the 50-year-olds will work till 70 or 80, but maybe not, um, you know, something we should bet on. Um, but uh, the, the thought is, is obviously we have to replace that, that skill level. And even some of the skills that they're learning today 
are different than what you <coughs> needed to do to be a skilled machinist, uh, let's say, 20 years ago. And so, uh, you know, and so the concept of upgrading the skills and the knowledge within the workforce is very, very key to what I think we all have to do as employers in order to create the, uh, the talent that we need of our work. And am I right in, in hearing you say you've decided to bring most of that in-house, that, that you feel responsible for doing that? You are not relying on outside educational institutions to do that? Well, we, we do. We partner with Grand Valley. We partner uh, with uh, Ferris. We partner with Grand Rapids Community College. Um, all of, uh, we pay 100% of the educational expenses for all of our employees. Um, and, you know, we have tons of people at Grand Valley, tons of people um, doing the uh, engineering technology program at Ferris. So we have a whole bunch of people at Grand Rapids Community College through working in cohorts with our with other manufacturers um, going through, you know, apprenticeship programs and et cetera. And Spencer, um, in this White House uh, Council of Economic Advisors graph, uh, people making over $80,000 a year were relatively safe from automation, but I'm hearing you say that maybe surgeons are at some risk. Yeah, I uh, think this is it. It's a fascinating, uh, we'll call it debate right now. Uh, and I'll comment on our workforce, and I think there's some realities there that we're seeing a massive transformation and shift of our needs, as you can imagine. However, we're unique in that our end customer, uh, we'll, we'll use the orthopedic surgeon uh, as the example here, is really somebody that has some of the highest levels of education, is extremely specialized. Almost any particular total joint reconstructive surgeon is fellowship trained. So they go through all their medical school and they obviously advance through their residency and then they also do a fellowship to specialize in, in a certain pathology and care treatment. And now we're coming in with a robot and sort of augmenting and at some point potentially replacing them actually doing the important parts of the procedure, the cuts, the placement, the gluing of the implant back into the, to the body. All things that we believe the robot can do more um, accurately and pre predictably, which you can imagine the message that sends to somebody who just went to school for 13 years, a one year fellowship, and goes, well, hold on a minute, uh, I'm the doctor. And depending on your belief system, sometimes they think they're the only thing between up there, wherever that is, and, and that particular <laughs> patient. And so now you've got to come in and go, well, we're, this robot is going to potentially do what you're doing. So it's a delicate dilemma right now. Uh, but our belief is, over time, as the technology advances and more of this um, uh, technologies utilize that we'll see uh, the next generation of these skilled and trained physicians become more comfortable with utilizing that technology to perform their procedures. And we imagine a day, and it's probably a couple decades from now, that it will be commonplace for how they're trained and educated to understand utilizing some sort of technology to do the intervention and the procedure. You still need the human to diagnose, you still need the human to interact, you still need the human to have compassion and trust. Uh, a robot we don't think right now can do that. Uh, however, the mechanical, the carpentry, we'll use orthopedics again, can probably be done by a, a computer system, uh, which is technically what a robot is. But it's a, it's a very delicate debate right now because you can imagine who we're talking with, uh, and these are very important customers to us. If I transition and look at our workforce, uh, I shared this morning, if we look at our engineering function, which you can imagine is the source of so much of our organic development and growth in our organization, it's heavily focused in mechanical engineering. Uh, some of the basic sciences that build into the mechanical engineering mindset, and we are now questioning how does that translate to things that are driven by software, by code, by electrical engineering. And every product now we have is a little smarter, and this is a term that you use, it's generating data. We have all this information now that lives in the cloud. We're not even sure how to deal with all this information in the cloud. And you're taking a, you know, a population of thousands of R&D engineers that are historically focused in mechanical engineering and figuring out how to shift that workforce to more electrical and software engineers. And to make matters more challenging, we're trying to attract them to Kalamazoo, Michigan. Uh, <laughs> and last I checked, you know, they're, they're, they're much more comfortable on the coasts. <laughs> uh, they like the Bay Area, they like Washington, they like Boston, uh, and so you, these, are very, these are very real uh, issues that we're struggling with as an organization of how to find, and we do believe it's our responsibility. I mean, that, 
That's what creates value for our organization, intellectual property, future development. That's the organic engine that keeps us going. So this is a, this is a real time challenge and we look to higher education to help us with some of this, uh, this reality. Fred, a lot of people know you as the driving force behind Talent 2025. Um, thinking of those people who not, or not participating or under participating in the workforce, don't have access to higher education oftentimes. Do you want to speak to them and their plight prospects vis-a-vis -vis, uh, automation? Well, one of the things that we are dis discovering as we look at the data is that uh, not only is the unemployment rate important, but the participation rate's important. And we have uh, folks that are not participating in the workforce that don't get counted in the unemployment. And some of that is, is um, as you think about the, the challenges that Spencer and John and I are talking about, it's, it's the idea that, that um, we are, are faced with adjusting our abilities or being passed by. Um, and it, there, there is a point at which you become just so overwhelmed that you don't participate anymore. And, and that, uh, that's, a, that's a real situation in today's world. Uh, our participation rate is, is um, at a, a level in West Michigan that we could, in fact, have an, um, take care of all of our open positions, if you will, just with those who are not participating. Uh, so there's a, there's a real interesting uh, kind of balance that we're dealing with in that regard. Uh, the, the, the nature of business uh, and the nature of our work, um, everything, uh, the, kind of to Spencer's point, uh, it, it's amazing how many things you can define as an algorithm. So if to the extent that your, your, your work is something that you do in a routine way, it is subject to being automated. Um, the idea that uh, we have financial advisors that make <laughs> lots of money, but they're doing things that are pretty routine. Oh, excuse me, financial advisors. But uh, <laughs> it, it, it is, it's a matter of analyzing data, looking at the results, and then coming up with a conclusion. Uh, it's subject to automation. We're seeing more and more of that every day. So how do we then actualize ourselves as, uh, as, as people with the changing nature of work? I think it's an interesting question. I don't think it's an answer. I don't think we have an answer for it, but it's something that we have to start dealing with as a society. Can I pick up on that, and both with what you said and, and uh, Spencer? So one of the liabilities of being academic is that I, I will make references to obscure books. My apologies. Uh, <laughs> a book came out last year, um, senior editor at Fortune magazine, a guy named Jeff Coleman, the title of the book is Humans Are Underrated. And he's looking at these questions, and his answer in the book, and it goes to <coughs> something you said, Spencer, is that, um, and he quotes a, a VP from Cisco, who says, the most important skill in the 21st century will be empathy. Mm -hmm. And he specifically references medical personnel who yep. are going to be out of work on the technical side, but you still need somebody to interpret the screen, to interact with the humans. Um, and it's a hard sell, I think, oftentimes, to say, well, you know, this is a great opportunity because now you get to develop all these other softer side human skills and, and, and the automation, the logarithms can take care of a lot of the rest of it. I wonder if any of the three of you would comment on his thesis to the extent you're aware of it or, or if that makes sense to you or not. Well, um, the, uh, you guys get a chance to think, I, I gotta say. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> We have empathy for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's working. <laughs> Apparently not much, though. <laughs> I would say we spend a lot of time in our educational efforts within our organization um, with the softer skills. Uh, it's, it's how do we work together as a team? How do we solve these problems? Because it's more important for us to understand how to work together than it is to necessarily be working at these long lists of things we used to do uh, with um, uh, computer printouts and that sort of thing. And we'd, that all that is being done by the computer now. We can, that's a, getting the information is relatively easier. What to do with the information is much more important. So those softer skills are, are actually more important to us as an organization than they, than they have ever been. I, I, my belief is that the current generation of, of those entering the workforce today uh, 
the technology foundation is a table stake. It's a given. It's a yeah. must. You have to have it. Uh, and the education systems need to help you know, ensure these students are prepared when they enter the real world to have a strong technical foundation around the digitization of the world. Uh, it has to happen. That will be a requirement. Uh, it's the soft skills that will differentiate the individual. And there is a lot of work right now. Put your phone down. Uh, communicate. Talk. You know, handshakes, eye contact, all the basics that is being lost in some of our upbringing of, of tomorrow's leaders uh, because of this change in digitization. There's a reliance on it. Um, so I think it's, it's an interesting dynamic right now um, having to do both. You, you will differentiate with some of those soft skills. However, I think the technical skills related to uh, understanding coding, understanding computer systems, understanding uh, complex processes, that, that will be a given. We, we will expect this uh, in the workplace, mm -hmm. and it will be required and needed. Yeah. And, I, and I would say that you know, part of uh, team culture and, and getting people uh, to work and, and leave everything on the table when they're working in a setting with, with a team is wanting to be there. And, and they're not going to do that in an organization where there isn't empathy, where they don't enjoy the group of people they're coming to work with every day. They don't enjoy working for the leadership of that organization because they don't think they're necessarily motivated on the right things. And we see this very much with our younger workforce. Um, they're as much excited about what it is we make um, as anything else, because we're obviously in the med device space, so it's very good to feel good about point. how we're uh, helping human health. And we have people in our building that wouldn't be there if we didn't make that kind of product. You know, they, if we were making auto parts like we, I used to do, they, they're not motivated the same way they are by, by the, fear, the fact that they feel like they're helping the world. And so they're motivated by what they do and the, peop the group of people that they're also working with. Um, and so I, I think that is where the, the empathy is really important and you need to create a culture in your organization where that um, you know, can be realized. Go a little bigger picture. Fred, start with you again if you don't mind. And that is um, what, what excites you the most about increasing <coughs> automation um, possibilities for artificial intelligence, robotics, and what worries you the most about it? Wow. Um, they, 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 told, they said you were up to this. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me use an example of, of excitement uh, that uh, in the world, I mean, I, I happen to drive an electric vehicle, um, a Tesla, and it is absolutely a disruptive feeling to, to drive one of those vehicles. And to understand that, um, uh, just a couple of examples, GM is, is going to have 25 models out before too long. Uh, Volkswagen is committed to having 50 models, have put a $23 billion purchasing package together for batteries. Uh, when you think about the disruption, and every major, every automaker now is, is going after electric vehicles, it makes sense. You don't have, a, a, you know, a cylinders uh, bumping up against each other. You don't have spark plugs. You don't have transmissions. You don't have mufflers. You don't have uh, oil to change. It, you don't have service. Now talk about a disruption for the, the, uh, the, mm -hmm. the industry. It doesn't take much. It doesn't take a 50% change in the auto industry to cause a disruption. It can be a 10% change. And the idea that, that uh, as we see more and more electric vehicles coming out of the marketplace, uh, the number of service stations will go down. The number of gas stations will go down. The, it, it, this is just a, it's a, an amazing kind of transformation that will take place. So on the one hand, it's exciting. It's really the right thing to do. I mean, the, when you, when, after you've driven an electric vehicle, you get back into a, a, a combustion, internal combustion uh, car, you go, really, why? Uh, it's, it's, it's an amazing transformation. <laughs> and, and the idea is that, that is, that's, that's, a, that's a wonderful thing on the one hand. On the other hand, what's going to happen with all these things? So that's, that's what I'm, I'm concerned about. I can tell we're on the, the west side of the state. I wasn't sure you were allowed to have Teslas in Michigan. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> I've lived all over uh, the U.S. and on both coasts, and I've lived in the Bay Area a couple different times, and, and um, I followed the Tesla story closely. A good friend of mine was the head of HR there, and I went and toured it as, as they went through this, and it is just fascinating uh, the way they, they think about their business. And interestingly, just a quick little story for you, they put some of their best, best and brightest, their smartest people on a predictive analytics team, and any of their major challenges or problems that they're thinking about in the future, they take to that team and they build the algorithms around them and they run a bunch of models to figure out what will happen. Does it go this way, this way, or this way? And they do this over and over and over. And they're also then capturing within this set of information how it gets a little smarter and smarter and smarter. I hear this and I think I'm in like a sci-fi movie I'm, when I talk to people from organizations like this. Um, so I'll start with what scares me a bit and then I'll, I'll leave you with a little hope and optimism. Uh, but on the scary side, and, and I think it's uh, probably a bit more personal, if you're running traditional manufacturing companies, which is in essence what a big medical device company like ours is, there are other organizations out there, other entities, other businesses, you know them. Uh, one begins with an A, one begins with a G, uh, and they, they have a new opportunity to, to utilize information, utilize their processes, utilize their workforce to solve some problems that we might be too slow to get to. Uh, so when we think about a shift in our landscape of the companies of tomorrow, um, some we don't, they're not even invented yet, they haven't started, but some, an Amazon of the world, is obviously dramatically changing the landscape of how we all live our lives. You parachute down in China, it's a whole new set of other companies, uh, differently regulated, so a, a different set, but similar uh, advances. In big traditional companies with massive workforces that are establishing communities all over the world, we're struggling with how do we make sure that we remain relevant and di differentiated. And that's a scary proposition right now. Uh, now, on the hope side and the optimism side, there are significant problems in the world that are going to be solved with this advancement in digitization. Uh, robotics is playing a massive role in reducing errors in healthcare, which is a, an extreme expenditure right now in the healthcare system. The next step in the dirty secret in healthcare is it's extremely complex. Part of that complexity creates a tremendous workforce. So hospitals have to employ lots and lots of people to make sure that all the products are in the right places, all the equipment works, the medical device companies have to employ these people. Uh, a lot of those roles will be shifted. Some will be eliminated. Uh, however, it will ultimately make a more efficient system. So we think of healthcare, which in the United States is one of the more, um, I would say, challenged segments in terms of its efficiencies we're gonna be able to solve some really big problems and make it more efficient and provide better care. And back to John's comment around if, if that's a part of a mission, if that doesn't wake you up early in the morning to try to go solve, uh, then you gotta check your pulse. But what a, what a phenomenal challenge for us in using this technology to allow us to do things we haven't been able to do before. So I think that's what gets me excited in the hope. And I, you know, we are trying to transform our, our digital strategy to ensure that we remain competitive and relevant. And, and we're doing a pretty good job at the moment, but uh, with some anxiety at times. Yeah, and I, I, would, uh, I would just comment on, I'm, I'm, uh, I have obviously concerns that, you know, you take a look at the auto industry, which um, I sold my automotive business in September 2014. I would like to say that I did that because we were totally internal uh, combustion engine, totally internal combustion engine, and I saw all this coming. Uh, but that wouldn't be true. <laughs> Uh, but the, um, we, I see the electric power plant as something that, if you look at the introductions of models right now, um, by 2023, if you just look at a natural pace of that, half of our vehicles will be electrified. And so we will have electric power plants. So if you are in the internal combustion engine business, I, I think you've got a problem. And so there's a lot of people employed by that business right. Um, today that are going to have to change the way in which they work. Mm -hmm. And so this is, the, this is the concern I have, and this is the concern I have particularly about Michigan. Um, you know, we don't do very well educationally, um, you know, as a state. We're in the, certainly the bottom 10 by almost any measure um, of states across the, of the country. Um, in terms of our educational levels and proficiency in third grade reading, um, the K through 12 system is where I'm, I'm particularly focused. We actually have very good higher ed um, in the state. Um, 
you know, institutions like Grand Valley, Michigan State, and Michigan, I mean, you know, there are talked about, I think, all over the, all over the country. And so, uh, you know, as great institutions. But when you look at um, what it takes for one of my employees to learn this new skill and this, uh, this new ability, they need fundamental uh, learning like math and reading levels. And our levels are very low um, in Michigan. And so, you know, we're in the, the bottom 10, as I said, and, and, and to think, you know, I think one of the things that happens is people say, well, that's not my school district, or it's not my, um, you know, it's the city schools or whatever that is, is causing this problem. That, that just isn't true. We can go to upper middle class neighborhoods, and you can look at reading proficiency in the third grade. And I was looking at this the other day, uh, in preparation for another meeting where we were looking at uh, literacy at the statewide level. And um, one of our um, neighborhoods here that we would all consider as upper middle class, 42% of the children in that school district cannot read in the third grade. It's just a startling number. And so, and I can get employees from there, but, you know, it's likely I'm going to get the ones that uh, didn't go to college, so uh, the, maybe the slower in terms of learning to read. And so in my ability to prepare kids when they don't, and it's not that they're not smart enough to do this, it's a question of they haven't learned or been taught what they need to learn um, to help them actually achieve this, um, this literacy that is required in order for them to adapt any of the skills training that I'm going to give them. And so this is, I think, the biggest barrier we have in order to gretting that workforce that's going to be, have to change their employment. This is gonna be the biggest barrier we have as a, as a state, and it's something we have to get in there and tackle and, and take care of. I have one last question, unless any of you wanna pick up on that. Great point. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Not to end on a dystopian note, but let's just say that uh, some of the prognosticators are right. And despite our <laughs> best efforts, educationally or otherwise, um, because of the changes, because of the doubling down on AI, et cetera, you're looking at 20, 25% permanent unemployment in this country and other developed countries because those lower skilled jobs certainly aren't there anymore. So one of the remedies that's being tried across the world many of you are probably familiar with, is something called guaranteed basic income or universal basic income. Um, Oakland, California is trying this, um, parts of Scandinavia, the Netherlands, Canada, et cetera. Um, as business leaders and, and, um, and owners, when you look at the possibility of simply sustaining people who, who no longer will be working because there simply aren't jobs out there. The automation has gotten to a point where we just simply have eliminated too many jobs. Granting that premise for the moment, whether it's tr correct or not. Um, is that an idea that strikes you as pragmatic, realistic, hopeful? So I, I'll take this, <laughs> I'll start with this one. And, and we're probably in a unique position because we have a, a fairly sizable global business and a global footprint. And we actually deal with uh, and I'll give you a, the reality of today, we deal with obviously various uh, economies and development cycles in a variety of countries all over the world that we do business. And they all have their pros and cons and the, and the associated workforces do as well. But the basic needs, um, when we think of infrastructure, healthcare, energy, uh, finances, education, these things exist all over the world. And, and it's our belief that innovation will solve uh, some of these workforce challenges or even unemployment challenges that may come up and down. There will be cycles. There is no doubt about it. There will be cycles. We've seen it in a, a wonderful developed country like the United States, uh, and we see it in others. However, if you look broadly across the world, these cycles sort of offset themselves and are going at all different times. Um, interestingly, right now, you know, the, the U.S. economy is actually falling a little bit behind in our global brand of 2017. We are ranked fourth in the world. Um, you know, so there's, there's some realities, I think, if you're 
growing up in America and an American that you have to realize now that maybe there's other parts of the world that might be further along the curve in terms of their economy and their workforces and some of that innovation. So I think that's probably something as a business leader we wrestle with more of trying to understand and keep up with it and make sure our, our book of business is balanced that way. Uh, however, I don't think the world will come to an end um, due to the, the rapid digitization and technology uh, transformation. Instead, I think that will open up new doors for additional innovation in all these different segments and it'll create more jobs. I think how we train and educate people to ensure they're prepared to handle these type of jobs is probably the bigger reality. It's a little bit of what John said. It probably starts at a very early age. And, John knows I'm, I'm passionate here as I have some young kids in, in a Michigan school and I've moved from out of state and I sometimes, I leave some of these meetings we're at together and I scratch my head, I go, ah, hope my kid can read. Uh, <laughs> so I've, I've quizzed them and you, so far- They don't so, go to that school district. So, so far so good, but, uh, but I think those are the realities and that's you know early education obviously through the, the high school years and then obviously into the higher education as well. And so it plays a very critical role. I was sharing this morning uh, just a, a brief story, I, I'm part of a program that um, a group of uh, 40 business leaders from across the world are studying for a week in three different uh, higher level education facilities. Uh, and these are esteemed institutions in their right country. And we started in China in Shanghai at SEBS, the Chinese European Institute for Business. Last week we were at Wharton, and in a couple weeks we're at IC, which is a, a leading business school in Europe. And I was sharing what's fascinating. I'm, I'm one of three Americans in the class. The rest of these business leaders are from all over the world, Africa, Asia, Europe. Uh, and interestingly enough, the way that the higher education system, the education systems in general, the way they shape uh, how people think and their biases and their look at the world uh, really plays into the mindset of how these people work and operate. Uh, and just the difference from being in Shanghai for a week in one of their advanced business schools, listening to how they're training, educating, and their thought process versus going into Wharton, which is you know esteemed, uh, self-proclaimed best business school in the world. I, I'm not here to say it is or isn't. It, it was a fascinating difference between the two. Uh, and one, by the way, in a in a world in an economy that has a long-term outlook, a different governance system, uh, a different approach to technology, a different approach to privacy, quite frankly, than if you come back to the United States. And so I think there's a reality here as, as we think about the worst case scenario or the best case scenario to really understand on a macro level across the world how all these different education systems uh, produce the individuals and what this means for the long-term success of our, our global economies. You wanna go? So I, I, um, I actually think the concept of uh, a universal Paycheck is absolutely the worst thing we can do. Um, and, and I'm in West Michigan, so I could safely say that. Um, but th the reason I think it's the worst thing to do is because take a look at the countries that are prospering, and the way they're getting there is by investing in their people. And how are they doing that? They're investing in their people when they're young, and they're investing in the people in their education. And in my mind, the way in which we compete as a, in the world is by investing in our, our young people throughout our communities and really trying to make sure that they get the best education and the best ability to compete um, in this world. And I don't think you get that by a <coughs> universal income approach of having a bunch of people sitting on the <coughs> sidelines watching. Um, and I don't think there is a, I don't think that makes for a very good society and et cetera. I don't, I think that we're gonna have to figure out safety net because there is gonna be disruption in, in massive ways. And so we have to figure out a way to get uh, those people the education they need to reskill um, to do other work. But I think that, uh, I don't think it's uh, uh, by making them part of the, um, uh, let's say not looking for work um, is, is kind of the effort. You want to weigh in or should we open it to questions? Well, I, I would just, um, um, I, I agree with a lot with what you're saying, John, but I also don't think we should take it off the table uh, as a universal basic wage uh, concept is something that when we look at how we're performing as a country, to Spencer's point, um, we have some tremendous disparities in this country. Uh, we've got people that are not able to participate 
uh, we've got, when you look at the, the chaos that is in somebody's life because they are trying to find out how to put food on the table, um, I think we've, we've got to be open to almost anything to, to see if there is a way in which we can have everybody participating because if no other reason, it's the way we're going to have growth of our economy. If you have people spending and earning, they're going to be participating in the economy in, in new ways. So I, I'm not so sure that we should take that off the table. I think that is something that, that uh, we have to assume that many people, maybe most people, maybe the vast majority of people, when they have something, they also want to be able to uh, work for something greater than that. And that, that will not, by having something at a basic level, will not take away an incentive to want to do something more. And so I think that's a, that's, I think we have to leave that open as a possibility. This, this sounds like part two of the <coughs> conversation. <laughs> but we did promise to open it to some questions from the audience, and uh, we will take those now. If you will speak up, please, Star. Yeah, I would, I would actually say that in the educational field, K through 12, um, we create the inequity that exists in our economic model. Um, and, and it isn't necessarily by the resources we spend, but it is the way we spend those resources. Um, because you, you look at what we spend in an urban district, it's a lot more than what we'll spend in even uh, a... Um, you know, a, a suburban district in, in terms of what we'll spend on invest in each individual student. But the way in which we're deploying that capital is not equitable. Um, and, and, and so as a result, we get a bimodal distribution in our education. Because the people that are at the top in all of our schools are actually at the top, I think, very close to the top in the world. And so you have the 30% or whatever that go on to college, those actually, you look at the average, that average would, would work out very well. We'd stand very tall in the world economy. But what we're doing is leaving a whole bunch of people behind by the way in which we're, um, I think, administering and dealing with um, how we teach to all of our children. Um, and, and I see real inequities. I mean, we're working with a, a pilot program in uh, three of the, you know, the poorest performing schools previously in the Grand Rapids Public Schools. And we've been able to make great strides by the way in which we're very carefully deploying uh, capital um, to help invest in those, those children's lives. Oh. Uh, related question. If if we accept the fact that education has a big part to play, two-part question. Number one, what's your opinion of the aptitude for innovation within the educational industry? <laughs> and then the second part, which is people seem to think that it's work or education, that these are sort of mutually exclusive as opposed to learning through work and the role that business can and perhaps must play in helping us redefine what education can become. You got a lot there. <laughs> um, so uh, um, the, the relevance of the workplace, uh, uh, to me, I think is where I would pick of those things you talked about. And the, and to, to the extent that students, as early as they can, can relate to how they might be able to contribute to the world through their work, I think is one of the most important things that the educational system and business can do together. 
uh, with the, the, there are so many interesting ways, and I'll, I'll just use the example of, of manufacturing. Uh, we talked today about manufacturing being much more, I mean, you, you, you think of the manufacturing of today with the gleaming uh, uh, workplaces that are there, the, the, the highly robotic, the highly automated, uh, the highly interesting, uh, fascinating things that are going on, uh, the teamwork that's required, it's a whole different kind of of place than people imagined years ago, uh, that their parents thought that they, that that uh, was was good for them. Uh, we now have a, a, an annual event; 9,000 high school students come to it uh, to understand what it means to be in the manufacturing world. Uh, that it it, it 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 there's an interesting kind of paradox that we have this wonderfully interesting. Uh, exciting high technology field that people don't understand and uh, we need to be, attract more folks to that that field we, we, we have a, a perhaps enough people in the in the region to be able to do that so uh, I, I think that to me it's it's understanding that as early as sixth grade fifth grade fourth grade uh, to be able to have uh, young students understand how they can contribute to the world through their work is I think a very important part I think higher education in particular, the analog is the manufacturing companies. If they've been established and around a long time, it's tough to innovate because you've got to keep the brand and sort of the ways you've done things and, and uh, the governance of a lot of the institutions also challenge innovation as well in higher education. So I think that's a reality that uh, business has to help uh, challenge and also has to partner with higher education on the realities of what's going on in the workforce and then translate that to what are the skills and some of the needs of the next generation of, of employees. Uh, but I do think it's a real challenge. Um, some that have been around and established and have departments that have always thrived X, Y, and Z way, they're, they're less likely to change. No different than the big business that looks over their shoulder in the rearview mirror and says, well, we've always done it this way. It's been pretty darn successful. However, we've seen in higher education some pretty disruptive companies come out there or organizations, education institutions where open source education now, online education, some other ways of teaching and learning that I think uh, also drive the realities of what the workforce looks like today uh, as well. But I also think that's a, it's a responsibility of business to partner with uh, the education facilities in their communities and quite frankly across their geographies to ensure that there is a open dialogue about the realities of the workforce and, and what's needed. I was sharing that I went to undergrad at Miami of Ohio <clears throat> and I was recently with the business school there and they've actually, as part of their core curriculum for their freshman business school students, they have to take a coding course. Coding. And I said, what? He goes, yeah, coding. He goes, we can't get these kids jobs unless they understand the basics of coding. I said, well, they're business school. What about accounting and economics? They said, coding. They said, yeah, business, or accounting and economics as well and all that good stuff. But I, that's the type of change that I was like, okay, good, that's, that's what's needed. Uh, but I think it came from pressure from the employers that are hiring the kids after school to ensure some of these skills are being fostered in, in undergraduate programs. So, Thank you. I'm going to ask President Haas to make closing remarks. <coughs> Actually, I'm going to start off with a request <coughs> other than saying thank you, and I have a few comments. But we have uh, students over here. So rapid fire, what bit of advice are you going to leave these students with as a result of your presence here today? Fred, you can start real quick. Go. Be, be Here's all the students. Raise your hand again. <laughs> all right, there they are. They're uh, be, US right now. Be flexible and uh, open to the, uh, the changes that are coming, and uh, be willing to think ahead of where your employers are today. OK, Spencer. Be comfortable being uncomfortable. Make sure you force yourself to be uncomfortable. Go into new situations, new adventures, and, uh, and hopefully aspire for leadership uh, and help us make the world a better place. Thank you. John. This should only be the beginning of your education. Um, you need to become a lifelong learner. I, I, I do a week a year um, at another educational institution just to keep my uh, game sharp and you know, to get me thinking differently than I would if I was sitting at home. Okay, thank you. Let me uh, start off by saying uh, th thank you all for, for coming and appreciate uh, Joan and, and Peter again for their uh, vision on creating this space for us. Thank you.
Um, thank you, uh, Michael. Thanks for moderating. And uh, Bill, thanks uh, again for being one of our, our hosts. And uh, also, again, appreciate the, uh, the students uh, coming here as well. Been wanting to do that, uh, these breakfasts, is ask that question. So thank you for participating in that. Uh, I also wanted to uh, recognize we have a cup up here. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's kind of like March Madness in a way. Uh, and then we have a check over there. The Association for Corporate Growth uh, uh, of the schools that participated <coughs> this year, which included Aquinas, Central Michigan, Cornerstone, Grand Valley, Hillsdale, Hope, uh, Michigan State, University of Michigan, Western. Uh, they had uh, two uh, uh, programs, one for MBA students, one for undergrads. And it just so happens in the 10th year, Grand Valley MBA, right here, number one. Woohoo! Yeah. So let me just wrap up on a, on a couple of notes that I took down here. Um, I've been uh, sharing this with uh, numbers of people, but I just uh, uh, completed uh, some months ago Tom Friedman's book, uh, Thank You for Being Late, where he was talking about <laughs> technology and the environment and the social fabric on how that is changing. In the economics club, which I participated in uh, with the executive committee, uh, we are looking at uh, the acceleration of change as a theme for this year, we, we just had uh, uh, one of our local talents uh, here, the CEO of, uh, of Ford uh, here, and we, he was also on this stage as well, talking about that particular note of the acceleration of change, primarily driven, again, by technology. And right here at uh, Grand Valley, I know our provost is leading this uh, with our uh, faculty, and it's called really High Tech, High Touch. Uh, looking at the changing dynamics and delivering and motivating our students uh, in, a, in an evolving and changing world. That notion of high tech, high touch comes through. But um, I also wanted to make mention, you said you were been on uh, two coasts? Yes. Well, you're on three, because this is the North Coast. Ah. <laughs> As a Coast Guard guy who's stationed here in the lakes a couple of times, this is from the Coast Guard standpoint, the North Coast. North Coast. So you Three coasts, everyone. Three coasts. <laughs> Three coasts now. Okay. So, uh, but uh, also, one last note, too. Um, I, I really appreciated the uh, uh, comments made by all three of you in terms of 25 years ago, excuse me, 25 years from now, these students are going to be in mid-career. You were talking about some of those skill sets that are going to be necessary for them. 25 years from now, they're going to be leaders in our industries. And you talked about something very dear to my heart. It's STEAM, science, technology, education, arts, and math. And so what you described there is the core of a liberal arts education as well. So thank you for doing that. And finally, um, uh, I have uh, three certificates uh, here for each one of our participants. And I will do it this way. I'll just hand them to you. But, uh, each one is uh, from the Stephen College of Business uh, on behalf of the Peter F. Secchi Breakfast Lecture Series, uh, sponsoring a hydrate biosand fil water filter in your name for pure water uh, for World in Honduras, outreach hosted by Cascade Engineering, Native en Energy. So, and I'm going to do it this way. Uh, John, um, you are now th uh, the board chair, two times uh, leading uh, our um, uh, Grand Valley State University, I appreciate uh, your leadership. Uh, next is Fred, Talent 2025, as mentioned. Thank I get you. to work with, with Fred and other uh, colleagues in the uh, industries here. And Spencer, I just met, but I was really appreciated your, your forward lean on leadership and changes in the healthcare fields. Uh, here at Grand Valley, we're participating in that change as well. So Excellent. Uh, thank, thank you. you. So let's recognize our speakers again. Thank you. Michael, thank you, sir, for, for participating. Pleasure. And uh, everyone, uh, in less than five weeks, uh, we, have a, we will have a new uh, crop of uh, graduates uh, ready to uh, either uh, go into their first uh, part of their career, going to uh, uh, other uh, educational opportunities. But in my mind, I'm always buoyed at this time of year by the optimism of our graduates. So thank you all. Happy spring. God bless. Thank you. <coughs> thank you. Thank you very much.